Finally, uh, at least for those in the room, uh, we're going to go to Catalina. Welcome. Uh, better late than never. Uh, <laughs> I hear you got stuck in traffic. Uh, your 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 view uh, from Latin America, the Latin American perspective, probably the region, uh, well, one of the regions that has the most experience when it comes to illicit drug flows. You have 12 minutes. Okay, I'll do my best. Uh, can I? Yeah, I, yeah, I think we have the uh, presentations. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Okay, uh, thank you so much, and uh, I apologize really for being late. I think I am uh, sweating oil, as we say, <laughs> and I think Alina and others in ODI are as well. Um, I am officially one more person who hates the weather in London. <laughs> uh, so, but, um, well, this is a very important issue for us at International IDEA, and I'm very glad to be here. Uh, International IDEA is an intergovernmental organization composed of 28 member states uh, whose mandate is to support democracy worldwide. And definitely this issue of the nexus between organized crime and politics is at the center of our attention because it is one of the main, main threats to democracy today. And Latin America is quite important in this respect. Sure. Um, Latin American politics has been unfortunately permeated uh, in some countries and in some localities, particularly by organized crime. Uh, and some of the issues, I'll go quickly on this, uh, that have made uh, Latin America particularly vulnerable to organized crime include well, first of all, is the amount of money out there uh, from organized crime. So according to UNODC, approximately 1.5% of, of the world's GDP comes from transnational organized crime. Half of that comes from illicit drug, the illicit drug trade, most of which uh, is uh, cocaine. Uh, and Latin America is unfortunately still the continent that um, produces the main producer of cocaine. So there is a lot of money out there. There is also other issues pertaining to organized crime, such as ma illicit, illicit and informal mining, um, human trafficking, etc. But uh, illicit drug trade remains the main issue in Latin America today. On the other side, we have very costly elections. Um, there are few estimates uh, that uh, include the region as a whole as to the rising cost of elections, but uh, there are many indications uh, that uh, show this, uh, how this has happened. So uh, many researchers uh, from Brazil, for example, have showed how in the last 10 years it has uh, increased uh, substantially and in other countries. So this is a, an increasing issue. And lastly, uh, we have uh, a system that is still struggling to fine-tuning and, and enforcing uh, laws uh, on uh, political finance. So our own database, uh, International Ideas uh, Political Finance Database, uh, shows, for example, how out of 33 countries in the region, s only 17 have laws that um, force parties or candidates to uh, regularly disclose uh, their, um, their f assets and, and the resources they have. So there is still a big challenge, and I mean, those are just uh, the countries that have the laws, but then uh, the enforcement of those laws is another issue. So this is still uh, an issue that we're struggling with. So this has created a great opportunity for organized crime to basically launder money through politics in different ways. Uh, we have gathered this, this and other case studies in Latin America and in the Baltic states. Uh, as a way to illustrate, um, rather than to make a comprehensive uh, study, but illustrate some of the ne ways that these nexus uh, are created. So I went uh, with the support of the Social Science Research Council, particularly the Drug Security and Democracy Fellowship Program, uh, and together with uh, the Netherlands Institute for Multiparty Democracy, NIMD, and the Netherlands Institute for International Relations, uh, Klingendale. I went to basically to, we have been gathering these cases in different countries. I went particularly to Colombia, uh, which as you know is still together now with Peru, the main cocaine producer, and where I come from, by the way. Uh, and I went to a, a municipality uh, which is close to uh, Medellin. Um, so ma many of you would know Medellin. Unfortunately, in the 1980s and 1990s, Medellin was the hub of uh, the cocaine trade because of the activities of the Medellin cartel, headed by Pablo Escobar. Uh, and uh, this didn't only sort of uh, affect Medellin, but also the surrounding area. So the, the metropolitan area of Medellin, and I apologize because this is in Spanish, but Medellin's metropolitan area uh, also includes Pejo, which is, um, if you see um, just north of Medellin, Bello is a municipality that has been also part of the structure that was created uh, by the Medellin cartel. So 
there are currently 13 gangs that still operate in Bejo, uh, and that uh, whose origins can be traced back to the structures uh, created by, by Escobar. Um, and in, in like looking at uh, Bejo, I found I interviewed around 30 people from the security services, from journalists, uh, different people, politicians also, uh, and gathered around 100 uh, media articles about uh, this case in particular. So I found two very interesting characters. One is called the man in the right uh, is uh, Hugo Albedo Quintero, and the man on the left is Oscar Suarez Mira. So I'll tell you more a bit more about them. So Hugo Alvaro Quintero, uh, by all means, he's a very successful businessman. He owns uh, the main transportation company in the, con in, in the region uh, called Bellanita de Transportes. Um, and this company holds the monopoly of transportation in uh, the municipality and part of the region. Um, but underneath uh, this successful businessman uh, lies uh, basically the, the head of uh, one of the most feared gangs uh, there and by large uh, the, who controls basically uh, the criminal world in Bello. So he's labeled as El Patron de Bello, Pet, um, Bello's boss. And, and it's not coincidence, that's the same title that Escobar had in his time. Because besides controlling crime, he was he's also known to provide basically lots of gifts and services to poor people in the city. So very much like the same style Escobar had in his time. Um, and um, Quintero was um, linked to a larger crime syndicate, uh, which is called La Oficina de Envigado, Envigado's office, uh, which is the name of, yeah, basically they, among other things, they control or partly control uh, the so-called white uh, gold triangle, which is uh, connects um, cocaine produce um, production in Cauca, with uh, distribution from the Pacific Coast in Uraba, and finally money laundering in Medellin. So he was uh, supposedly, and he was convicted in 2010 for this, uh, for his links t uh, by providing, for example, um, ways to launder money for for this um, uh, crime syndicate and among other things. So um, he used uh, also partly his political connections uh, to facilitate uh, this money laundering and other criminal activities. So on the other hand, we have Oscar Suarez Mira. So he's also by all means apparently a very successful politician. He has uh, won elections uh, to be mayor and he was even in Congress as first representative and then senator. Uh, and uh, well, he's basically the leader of the conservative party. So in Bello, the two main uh, political parties have always been the liberals on the one hand and the conservatives on the other. Uh, and he was the head of the conservative party. Uh, his, you can say, nemesis or uh, his counterpart was always uh, this other man, Rodrigo Arango. He was the head of uh, the liberal party. And what happened was that in 2002, they made an agreement to basically share power. So this resembles very much a structure that existed also in Colombia after the 50s, uh, after the so-called violent times in Colombia, where both liberals and conservatives decided to share power. So in one election, one of them always won, and next election the other, and so on and so forth. Uh, so they made this agreement in 2002, and that's what has happened. It uh, ceased for a while, but it was uh, reinstalled um, um, in 2010, and this has created a very surreal political system because uh, political competition is uh, almost inexistent uh, by default. Uh, for example, in the 2011 election, uh, there was only one candidate. It was a single election for mayor. So the whole sort of system I is um, basically non-existent. I will explain a bit later what happened with this 2011 election, which is quite interesting. Uh, as a way to understand how these uh, linkages uh, have affected democracy. So what has this meant for, for um, the political system? So this connection with uh, gangs, and I, I have to say, Oscar Suarez was convicted uh, earlier this year in, 2000, in 2013 uh, for his linkages to paramilitary forces uh, that were found to have uh, helped, him, helped him win elections. Uh, and the, the same conviction by the Supreme Court found that he indeed have link, had linkages with uh, Oscar Suarez. So what this has meant for the political establishment in Bello is, uh, first of all, 
uh, getting financed. So um, according to my sources, um, everybody basically knows uh, that um, these gangs provided finance, especially during elections, uh, both uh, monetary and in kind, mainly providing logistics, etc., during election campaigns also by mobilizing voters. Uh, so again, to connect to the 2011 election, uh, because there was just one candidate, there was quite a popular uh, movement to vote blank, you know, to vote for the blank ballot. Uh, and um, so what the gangs did to counteract uh, that uh, political sort of uh, movement was um, bringing people to vote for that single candidate. So uh, many of my sources tell me how many people were taken in buses, and Bellanita transportes buses basically, mm -hmm. uh, to vote uh, for the single candidate. But in spite of that, I have to say, I mean, uh, it's quite a remarkable story because uh, the, the blank ballot won. It's the second time in Colombia's history that the blank ballot wins. So it's quite, it was quite an unusual situation in Colombia. And finally, uh, it, this has also uh, created the possibility uh, to threaten voters. Uh, and continuing with the story of this 2011 election, uh, after this blank ballot win, won, uh, according to electoral law in Colombia, um, they have to call for new elections. And, in, and um, the person who got most uh, votes would win, regardless of any um, blank ballot or any um, level of absentee or whatever. So what the gangs did in that case was then to threaten people and uh, um, so that they wouldn't vote, basically, for because then there were more candidates. And uh, there was more than 70% of absentee level uh, in those elections, in contrast to the previous, just very recent election where the blank ballot won. So uh, it's a clear indication that there was um, other forces, there were other forces that uh, basically prevented people from participating. And on the other hand, for organized crime, this has meant f uh, having access to procurement uh, processes. Um, it, this even had an official structure. So in um, 2002, when um, Oscar Suarez's sister was the mayor of Bello, they created something called uh, the peace table or the peace accord in Bello with all gangs. And uh, these gangs uh, found the two founded minutes. Okay, foundations uh, to basically um, uh, have access to contracts with, um, with the municipality. And um, even though that soon uh, faded because it was so clear that they were still operating, um, they continue today uh, to, to to work and to operate. On the other side, yeah. they have gained access or they have uh, benefited from easy, mo easy mobility and lack of persecution. So basically, this is the, the main uh, gain for organized crime is uh, not that the state is doing something for them, but rather that they are omitting or they are not doing what they should do, which is to prevent them from operating. So. Um, this is uh, just an illustration, as I said, of, of what has happened in this municipality. But this plays uh, for us a picture, a uh, very similar picture of what is happening in Colombia and by a larger extent what to what is happening to Latin America. Uh, we have gathered around 12 similar cases and they all uh, show different trends. I will just name two trends and uh, I will stop with that, but it just two main trends. Uh, that uh, summarize uh, some uh, the two main issues we have found uh, in Latin America in this respect. One is regarding political parties. So we have seen, unfortunately, an increasing um, fragmentation of political parties uh, where they are uh, increasingly less uh, medium for transmitting an ideology but rather uh, sh uh, sort of shell institutions uh, uh, that, um, like for example, the case of Imbejo very uh, clearly uh, exemplifies uh, are just um, sort of the, the means for, for money to be channeled uh, mainly t during elections. Um, they have also used, or the increasing number of single candidates or can like, yeah, candidates running um, um, as single candidates. Uh, increasingly sort of hollows uh, the role that political parties usu usually s are supposed to have in filtering uh, candidates that have dubious uh, pasts. 
And also they are increasingly using political figureheads. So uh, it's often the son or the daughter or the brother or the sister who is running. Even in Bejo, uh, they were telling me the story of uh, one member of a gang who You're officially out of time, so okay. last point. Okay. Uh, well, I won't tell you then what happened. You can t ask me <laughs> in the Sa questions. Save it for later. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, but I have to say, I mean, this also affects um, elections. Um, these are not relations that are created for a particular election. Uh, oftentimes, uh, there are very much stronger relations that are connected to by family ties or business ties, but definitely bear fruit or are uh, most obvious during election time. Um, and um, well, no, I'll, yeah, I'll save the layer for later. <laughs> so thank you so much. Thank you. In case anyone was planning to leave early, now you've got a good reason to stick around. Um, so we've got three, thank you so much, Catalina, three very powerful examples, three different geographies, three different experiences, but obviously a lot of commonality. And the common thread is that um, politics, elections, government is, can and is being disrupted by and, dis and, and not in very positive ways. We're not going to go to um, the two people who are not in the room with us, but will be contributing to this. We have two discussants.